it's my pleasure to introduce Mercedes, Professor Mercedes Moroto Valle, who is our opening keynote for the session. Um, Mercedes is the IDRIC champion, um, and I'm sure she'll cover a little bit more in her keynote. So I'll hand over to you, Mercedes. Thank you. So thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'm using the lady microphone. Perfect. Good. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, I guess, for, for many reasons. You know, it's, it's also, uh, you know, having such a diverse, uh, talented um, speaker, sorry, uh, audience, we say, really covering so many angles as well and so many disciplines. So I hope, out of what I'm going to say in the next 20 minutes or so, that I say something that's of interest to you. But I also have to confess one thing. Maybe tonight when I speak with my children, I told them I was giving a presentation in the Etihad Stadium. Maybe I finally get to impress them with something. Uh, but, but they are quite difficult to impress. But anyway, it's, it's really delighted to be here. So thank you so much. And I think the other point I, I want to make, because sometimes one forgets these things, is really, you know, just saying congratulations to these nine research centers. It's not easy to pull what they've done here. It's not easy. Uh, so I think I really want to just say big congratulations. And I'm going to ask you, please, if you join me in a round of applause, because this is a fantastic opportunity that they are giving all of us to be here. And, and then to make things even more difficult, then they told me the title of my presentation, right? And, and I thought, well, I could talk a little bit about industrial decarbonization, I could talk a little bit about what I do for a living, but they said, no, no, we want you to talk about net zero. And we want you to talk about past, present, and future. And I was thinking, I guess past, I guess maybe I'm getting of a certain age that I can talk about the past of, uh, of net zero. But really, net zero hasn't been going for quite some time, to be honest. It hasn't been that long around the block. But I'm gonna do my best. I'm going to try to share some pearls of wisdom, but if anything comes as an advice, take it with a big, big health warning. So let's, let's get going. Okay, um, so I'm based at Harriet Waters, as Kari said, I'm the director of, and champion of industrial decarbonization, but also the other thing as well, and I'm very passionate, I'm deputy principal for sustainability. So basically it's day in, day out, it's, I'm really pushing uh, sustainability, it's really my passion. It's just so important what we're doing here. It's important for us, it's important for your generation, it's important for the generations to come. And there was a message I picked up in the news a few weeks ago, and it was really worrying. But some of the coming generations, they do not want to have children because they are concerned about the planet they would be living in. And, and the planet is going to stay here. It's us who may not stay here, let's be clear on that. The planet will stay just maybe it's not good conditions for future generations. So I'm really, really passionate about this, and I feel sometimes privileged to be able to work in this space, and particularly today to, to address uh, 20 minutes or so. I've given you some, some words of what I see in the net zero space. So let's just start with two numbers um, 90 ppms, and the other one is 300,000 cars. Any quick hands up why you think those numbers are there? One of them is a little bit obvious, maybe I don't know the PPM, why we are in the conference as you tune. But the cars, what is it of? I'm just gonna let you mull over that and I will say it at the end of the presentation. Um, and if I forget to say, then you have an excuse to come and talk to me. And um, so let's do that. So, so this is something I haven't actually been using this graph, I have to say, for quite some time. This graph was made by uh, one of my students when I was working at Penn State University, so he deserves all the credit. But as I was preparing for this presentation, I thought maybe it's time to look a little bit back. So that's why the graph actually finished in 2000. doesn't take that many 20 years, but it's really a very powerful message. And the way it's choreographed, you can see that CO2 emissions are going up. But what this graph is really powerful is that you can see that when that red dot jumps, it's actually because there have been significant advances without which ones, those ones, we couldn't really imagine the way we are living today, right? So you see how they are been coming up, things from you know, the steam engine, the cars, planes, microprocessors, big cities, heavy energy intensive industries. And it's all that together, when you think about all that, that's the reason really why the CO2 emissions have been going up. Because up to now, to a big extent, they have been tidying up CO2 emissions with economic growth. And I'm going to come back on that, but that's really been the main driver. Everything that's been meaning in terms of economic growth, it has been come, it has come with the price tag in terms of CO2 emissions. And net zero, I, I already said that you know, it's, it's really a short story. It doesn't go that long. And 
I think we have a bit of issues with the projector, so you may not see it as clearly in this screen, but if, if you have the website there as well, it's maybe not very clear. Uh, but really the, the message in there is that if you look in terms of one net zero, as such, we start talking about that. It's probably going to be this last decade, this last 10, 12 years. I mean, the Paris Agreement take us to 2015, and it was only a little bit before, around 2015, when we really start thinking that we need to start putting CO2 emissions. There needs to be a way to get the net zero. So we haven't been talking about this for so long. And we have made quite big changes, quite big challenges that we have actually been accepting on a global scale. And again, you have the sources of uh, these different graphs. But what you can see on that one, I'm actually going to display it on my own screen because otherwise I have to be looking back there. But what you can see on that one is uh, all the companies that have committed to net zero. You can see all the countries, all the type of business that have committed to net zero. That's massive. That's massive. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of you are already saying, well, it seems to be the eternal optimistic. No, I'm the realistic optimistic. We have made huge progress in a very short period of time. And if you look in terms of the next slide, uh, what you see in this one here is actually, it shows you emissions worldwide. Worldwide, we have 83% of the emissions, or the emissions, sorry, that actually committed into some net zero targets. Okay. If you look at that, 91% of the GDP is also committed in terms of net zero targets, and equally 80% of the population. And think about that, it has been in the space of 10 years max, as long as, as this has been going on, this conversation. And let, let's take another message a little bit in the UK. So what have we have been doing in the UK? And this is not actually just in the UK, it's an example, but you're going to find this in many other countries as well. So if you look there, and what we have been doing, the graph on the left-hand side, is we have been able to decrease our CO2 emissions and we have been able to increase our GDP. And, and if you look at that, it's actually going about maybe close to 50% of emission reduction or 70% of increase in GDP. So what that graph is telling us, the one on the left-hand side, is that it is possible to actually decouple emissions from economic growth. That is possible. Now, the realistic optimistic in me now kicks in and says the reason why we have achieved that is because we have decarbonized the electricity sector, the biggest stem. That's what we have in here. We have actually the penetration of renewables in the UK and Scotland, uh, where I'm coming from in Italy and many other countries, has been massive. And that's why those emissions have been going down and emissions have been going down and GDP going up. But the message here is possible to do it. Now, if we drill down, and that's the graph you have now on the right-hand side, what you can see now is that actually some sectors have been doing quite well. Again, electricity, as you know, many of you are very familiar with these messages. But there are other sectors, particularly when we look at transport, when we look at energy-intensive industries, that's the focus of Adric, where we actually are not doing that well. And, and really the challenge here is that those sectors are the really difficult ones to decarbonize. So if you let me put it in very plain terms, it's really about the, the low-hanging fruit we have harvested, all of it, every single piece that you can think of. So what is ahead of us is going to be much more challenging going forward. But it's possible. And in terms of we look in terms of how we are doing in the present. So we don't have a very long history. We have a very rich present, and I think we have a very good future to look forward if we do it together. But right now where we are is actually with 84 months to go to 2030. And I know the people in my team are thinking, oh, she's going around with this 2030 deadline, but it's really so important because by 2030, and I don't know how many of you realize, 2030, we need to get down globally 45% of the CO2 emissions, globally by 2030. And that's those 84 months that we have left to 2030. In the context of the UK, when this is even higher, we need to go around 67, 68% of our emissions have to come down by 2030. And if you look at the color, the traffic light map, then there are quite a few reds. Right? That means we are not doing that well. Uh, there are a few greens, and that's great, and there are other areas that we're still working on. But right now, we are not going to be meeting 2030 targets. It's as simple as that. We are doing things, we are doing the right things, but we are not doing them at the pace and the scale that we need to do them. So we need to increase the pace and the scale to be able to meet that 2030 target. And that 2030 target is really important because when we talk about the transition and net zero and the energy transition, it is extremely front-loaded. It's not linear. The energy transition is not linear, it's front-loaded. And that front-loaded comes to 2030. So we need to make sure that we do our very best in this critical decade. And it's possible. 
And so this is, again, the realistic optimistic in me tells me that this is possible. We have a series of technologies that are ready to be deployed. We need to do it at more scale and pace, but they are ready. And those are the ones that you have on the right-hand side. That's a sort of a new normal. There are other technologies, and that's why we, all of us here in the room, are critical in terms of research and innovation, where still we are not there. Maybe the technology hasn't completely matured. Maybe there's still different aspects of reducing costs or risk or the timeline or scale up. And those are technologies that are at the emergency stage. They are on the left-hand side. As it happens with any technology, and once it emerges, it goes to a diffusion stage before it actually gets into the new model. But there are things that we can do, technologies that we can deploy now, while we're still working on a parallel on actually bringing up all the technologies to market. And I mentioned before, and I'm just going to have one slide here about EDREC, um, but I did mention before that one of the sectors that we have left to decarbonize is industry. And it's a very challenging one. I'm not going to tell you all the reasons, because many of you are actually already from, from Idric here in the room, so you know all this, but really one of the reasons, just allow me to say one, is because even if we were able to provide only renewables to sectors like, for instance, cement, it still will be CO2 emissions, because the process itself, the process itself, emits CO2. So that, and, and also when you think about these industries, these are industries that the majority are low-cost commodity products operating in global markets. And here again is this message that many of you are familiar with about carbon leakage and how we should try to avoid carbon leakage as well. So the good thing is that in the UK we are thinking and doing things in this respect. The UK is actually the first country that published an industrial decarbonisation strategy. And IDRIC, the, the centre that I'm director of, is actually part of the industrial decarbonisation challenge funded through UKRI. And then within that, there is, as you can see there, there's an element of cluster plan projects, cluster plants, roadmaps, and IDRIC. And this is what we are very excited about, that we are part of this challenge. And it gives us a really unique ecosystem to work on bring our research uh, into a pipeline of innovation. So looking now a bit more into the future. So we covered very quickly the very short past that we have, the, the present, where we are, what we are doing. And then looking forward in terms of what's happened next. Well, for me, there are two elements that we really need to have in our toolbox, and those two are in there. One of them is that research, that innovation, and the one that you have on the, on the left-hand side, right-hand side, sorry, for you, is also around international collaboration. So if you look first on the left, and, and that's about the research and innovation, 50% of the global emissions do not have technologies mature enough to be deployed. And that's why we are here. That's why our centers are funded in whatever different area you work on, because those technologies, so those business models, so that policy, or that regulatory framework is not there. And that's why we need that research innovation. The good news is that 50% of the global emissions do have technologies to be deployed. And those technologies, it's important that they are deployed this decade and that infrastructure is being built or repurposed as needed. So that's one of the really important tools that we need in our toolbox. The other one, the one that you have on the right hand side, is about international collaboration. And I have to say that the first time I looked at that map, I was a bit shocked when I saw it. And then it really is an important message I think we need to get across. Without collaboration, and it's true that the graph there says international collaboration because that's the way it was coming from the IEA report. But I would like to say collaboration, what is happening in this room, and hopefully what will happen today and tomorrow. That's one of the purposes of bringing you all here. Without collaboration, in this case, without international collaboration, we may be delaying meeting next year that I have to 20 to 40 years. And that's what is going to happen. So when you are here, I definitely encourage what Carrie said, look at the different color dot and just make sure that you have those conversations because it's that collaboration that we really need to make this happen. And within research, and, and this is something that we are very keen in terms of getting this message across, it's important that we have this whole system support. And this whole system support sometimes comes into being because you have the room with different people, different skills, backgrounds, and different areas that they are working on. But at the end of the day, what we need to develop and deploy are solutions. And those solutions, yes, technology, as we say, still will need to be deployed in the ground, in, the ground in terms of these infrastructure projects. But equally, if you don't have that understanding, that societal behavior, those aspects, the social license to operate, if you want that, how is actually going to be the business models, the regulatory framework, planning, 
is also really key for these projects to go forward. So let's make sure that we have these whole systems understanding. And within that, again, going back to, to the graph of collaboration, is collaboration with impact. And an impact in terms of, you know, we are, I think most of us maybe in the room, we, we are academics or in an academic background or an academic setting working. And, and yes, it is really important that we write our scientific papers, very important for our community. But also there are many other different ways that you can have a wider impact on society. So I do encourage you to look in terms of how your research can have a much wider impact above and beyond publishing your papers. Think about the wider community that you're trying to reach out. And it's important because remember, we are lacking time. We are running out of time. So we don't have the luxury of somebody to come and eventually bump into your paper and think that this is the solution that I'm looking for. We don't have time for that. So we need you actively to be the best, the best scope person we can be to do on research. Get out there and get the message because you never know who's actually maybe needing for that solution that you just found. So don't restrict yourselves to, stay to those scientific papers. They are great, but we need to go beyond that. And I couldn't be more pleased really to be in this room, as I said before, because something I'm really passionate, I was talking about sustainability, I was talking about know, future generation, is really about the skills, talent, and leadership, and how those three go together. And you look in there in terms, it's really an opportunity, you know, maybe some of you are, I don't know, finishing maybe your PhDs or your postdocs, maybe thinking what is going to be next, did I take the right decisions, I still wonder that myself every day, so. You know, but, but really, when you look in that, you can look at the opportunities that there are jobs. And this is such an, such an exciting opportunity and market you know, to be part of this decision. And so we've been looking in quite detail, actually, and skills for the industrial big organization transition. And we published a couple of reports last week. We have a meeting in, in London. And what you can see in there is actually one of the key messages that came. And, and Charlotte has been leading this for Idrid. And I think we have also Anna as well in the audience here. This message really is, I think, is stuck with us after that meeting. And, and this came from quite a wide range of stakeholders we had in the room that day. And it was, we are going to be running out of the skills before we run out of anything else in the energy transition. And as we do something different, we are going to run out of people like you with your expertise. And so please do stay within the field of the energy transition because we need every one of you. That's really, at this point, the pinch point that we have. And the, kind of the, the final slide before I move into briefly some COP messages. Perfect. Um, so this is actually about, um, and I'm sure you probably get this question sometimes when you, you talk about your research to your friends or your family, relatives in this world, but why are we putting all this money here, really? Is this the right thing to do? And um, so we just you know, do something else? Is, is this really an opportunity? And, and I think these are really powerful messages from the McKinsey report here. And one thing I tend to answer when, when they, they ask me that question is really the real cost is the cost of inaction. We need to be very clear with that message. So if we don't do anything, that cost surpass by a great extent the cost of actually investing into research and innovation. And there are lots of opportunities. And all these opportunities, a number of them are thrown loaded. You are living at the right time, at the right place to make this happen. This is the decade to make it happen. And you can see there, the it may not be very clear, but in terms of it, you know, we are going to be moving into the way we produce our, let's say our cement, the steel, the way we actually produce electricity, the way we, we drive, the way we, we get around places, transport, heat, is actually going to have so many, many opportunities to have an impact. And this is actually a way to grow economic and social growth. So keep those messages as well. And then the, the last two or three minutes, I think it's a little bit of a segue into the, into the panel now here, is there some thoughts uh, about the COP27. Uh, so I was very fortunate to be able to, to be there in, in COP27. And earlier on this year, um, I was appointed to the Council of Engineers uh, for the Energy Transition. This is a new council. It's about 35, 34 of us. And then um, it's really given direct advice to the um, General Secretary of the United Nations. The reason for that is because it's a very clear message that out of all these negotiations, the voices that we don't tend to hear much is actually the voices of engineers and the voices of scientists telling us what really is possible and what is not really possible. So, so that's a really very powerful message for me. So we, yes, we are negotiating about words that are important. The single word that goes into one of those agreements is extremely important. But we need to move more into the action. And for me, that's really what I'm very pleased to be in a council 
So what we are looking there is actually how we can actually identify bankable projects across the world, talking with financiers, so actually these projects do get deployed at the space and scale that we need. And, and a couple of uh, reflections in terms of um, COP, uh, and then I think we're just gonna move to the panel. And, and these are just some initial thoughts. Um, I think the, the one thought that I, I got um, with me is in terms of uh, one of the positive things that came out is, uh, as you probably have heard, in terms of this loss and damage. So this is now part of the language and is part of one of the options. I think that's very important. Yes, the devil is in the detail, but I don't think we should be expecting that once this is approved in the COP, the data is going to be worked there and then. That's actually a community being set up to work out the details. It's um, some not very good news as well. We have to be, again, very realistic in terms of, you know, the commitments, in terms of the we are not on track to that 1.5, that message, unfortunately, maybe it's a little bit deleted compared to, to Glasgow, but we are making progress in that. So, so overall, I think we are just getting there, but in some areas, definitely, we need to get a lot more work on. I'm not going to go into detail because we'll cover it that. Some of the sort of final three key messages there, and one of them is about uh, an intergenerational approach. And this is very important because sometimes I think when we are thinking about climate change, we are thinking about my generation or the generation to come. But really, the only way to crack this problem, really, that is a global, is really how we think in terms of approaches that cut and go across generations. That's very important. We need to be inclusive in this just transition. I was really fortunate to hear the president of Barbados that you know has been very vocal in COP so, and, and see how this message, obviously about the loss and damage, but also the message around how we need to make sure that everybody, everywhere, captures the benefits of the transition. And I think that's very important because we need to make sure that those benefits, they are benefits of this transition, they need to be captured globally. And then I put in there a little bit of a, something I'm or in myself, as, as, a, as expression in terms, we know the energy trilemma, you've heard that. I think for me, something that I came out of COPE is that we also have a climate action trilemma. So we have mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage. Those are the three parts of that climate action trilemma. And I think we need to make sure that we approach them and we look into them the same as we are doing with energy transition and the energy trilemma around security, affordability and sustainability. So I think in terms of uh, wrapping up, uh, 90 ppms. Any idea what, what that was about? I can't believe you are shy in this room. I'm sure you're not. No, but you're right. I mean, ppms, atmospheric concentration, that's actually how many ppms we've been going in the last 50 years. So pretty much we've been going about, and, and it has not been linear, but we've been going about two ppms. If you look in terms of when we start going as ppm concentrations since the Industrial Revolution, and that take us in total probably we've been going up to 125, 130 ppms. Of that, 90 of those have been in the last 15 years. And if you put this in perspective into whatever is your lifetime, probably it's going to be most of those 90 that actually happen within your lifetime. 300,000 cars, that's a lot more challenging to come out. 300,000 cars, that's a difficult one, right? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you on that one, because it's, uh, yeah, what is going there? You always have to put a question that nobody's gonna answer, right? So it makes you feel, uh, I, I still have something to teach, hopefully one of these days. Um, so, so that 3,000 cars is actually, over the time I've been giving this presentation, 20 minutes plus, I know Carrie is eager that I, I wrap up, so I'm wrapping up here, Carrie. Um, over the, the time I've been giving this presentation, the emissions of CO2 globally are the equivalent of 300,000 in the cars, 3,000 cars in the road for one year. So we have no time to waste, that's the message here. We are really eating up our carbon budget and every minute ahead of us counts. So these are the last messages. Will net zero happen? Yes, it will happen. But there's those three attributes there. It's critical, it's challenging, and it's possible. But it will happen. How will, it, how will we make it happen? Well, the decade of the 2020 is going to be critical. It is from loading message that I already share. And what are the impacts, the impacts are on social and economic growth. And that's something we need to make sure we get those messages across. 
net zero is not an additional tax. Net zero is actually the way is what we have to do. We can do it, and it's going to bring the societal, social, and economic growth. And that's all. Um, together we can make it. And that's the message. We need every one of you in the room. Uh, use the best of your time. I wish that I had been given this opportunity when I was doing my PhD a few years ago. Um, but yes, it's, it's really been a pleasure being here. I hope I, I managed to share some messages, some pearls of wisdom, hopefully somewhere in there, you found them of interest. And again, thank you for giving me the opportunity and congratulations for putting all this together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mercedes. There's lots to think about and digest from that, and um, lots for us all to take away as well. Um, so we've got the we're going to be moving on to the COP27 reflections and actions action panel session. And um, so I'd like to introduce and welcome up Puya Hosenpuri, who's um, from Imperial College London and has been one of our early career researchers um, at UK CCSRC for since I've been at the centre, I think, um, who's chairing the session. So, what's up for you? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Puya Alpenpuri, and I'm a researcher at the Sustainable Gas Institute at Imperial College London. I have the pleasure of chairing this session, uh, which is about COP, uh, Action, uh, reflections and actions. So COP27 was finished about two weeks ago at um, uh, Egypt. So it was held at Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt and was aimed to mainly focus on the issues related to the global south and developing countries and branded itself as COP for Africa or Africa COP. So ahead of the conference, the Egypt president, uh, presidency um, made it clear that this is going to be a COP about implementation. So ma basically making countries accountable for what they have promised. So doing so, they outlined four key themes for COP27. The first one was about mitigation. So this is basically focus on implementation of targets and monitoring of the progress today. Most of the negotiations here was, led, uh, was about getting countries to do extra effort to uh, reduce their emissions in this critical decade that we are in until 2030 in line with 1.3 targets. Most of the negotiations were uh, pushed by uh, developing the developed countries and some of the vulnerable developing countries that are hardly affected by the climate disasters. The second theme was about adaptation. So this is regarding the minimizing and addressing the loss and damages associated with the adverse effects of climate change. So uh, this is basically how the, the uh, countries should change their economy and should invest money on their uh, infrastructure to become ready for a world that is warmer and climate disasters are more frequent. Uh, already many of the many people mostly in developing countries have already been affected by the climate disasters and recent floods in Nigeria and Africa are, uh, and uh, Pakistan are examples of that. So, develop, uh, so this is a big issue for developing countries mostly and it was expected to be one of the key topics that are going to be discussed in COP27. Um, this was also discussed in COP26 but it didn't lead, lead to any result, but this COP, uh, the developing countries were become more vocal about this and were uh, more united to ask to reiterate their request. And this led to a very big achievement that is probably something that COP27 will be remembered with, and that's the decision to set a new fund for loss and damage resulting from the climate change. 
So that was a very big achievement for the uh, COP27 after years of negotiations. The third thing, uh, theme that is, was about financing climate action in developing country. Again, this was hoped to be top item on the agenda of climate because this has been a very big issue, long thing, debates about this. There has been this uh, pledge by developed countries to provide 100 billion US dollar per year for a long time to developing countries to uh, target it at adaptation, mitigation, and loss and damage, but this has not happened yet. And this was one of the main topics that was brought up again and again this, uh, in the COP and was hoped to be uh, addressed here. And uh, this happens in the lives of that field. There are re, uh, the reports, but a lot by a lot of independent research centers shows that this 100 billion is a fraction of what is actually needed in this country, but we still haven't been able to um, secure financial mechanism to transfer this fund. And I'm emphasizing on the word fund here because a lot of uh, again there is this discussion should it be a loan or a fund so that's been also a lot of negotiations on that and lastly there was discussions about collaboration and how we should collectively reach so we have four great panelists here to discuss this uh, i want to involve william bleach to uh, uh from oxford energy institute dr william bleach is a senior research fellow at the uk foreign Commonwealth and development office and sorry and is also director of oxford energy associate which is an independent energy system research company he holds an honorary research fellow position at imperial college london williams area of research is about energy security climate change and sustainable development particularly particularly the electricity sector transition in developed and developing countries William, thank you. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, so, basically, um, was acting as the COP president uh, and hosting that event in Glasgow and I was quite involved in COP26. I didn't go to COP27 uh, so I don't have direct uh, experience of the event but I just wanted to make a few sort of uh, background remarks. Um, I've just got one slide so hopefully it's there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, so I'll just make some, oh, I can hear myself now, has that just been turned on? Okay, maybe you didn't hear the other comments. Um, so just brief, very briefly, uh, the FCDO, uh, the bit I come from is the Research and Evidence Division. Um, just to echo Mercedes's um, comments about the importance of research in this whole field. So exciting to see so many researchers here. Um, the whole point of the Research and Evidence Division of FCDO is to fund and promote re research and evidence and, and get that into action both in terms of informing the UK aid budget and how that's spent, but also in terms of creating global public goods to ensure that development is done well. Uh, I lead, um, my, my role is the Senior Research Fellow for Energy there, and I advise on uh, how research into the practice for energy transition uh, impacts on developing countries. So that's my role in FCDO. Um, um, I've got a single slide here, which I'm basing my comments on. Um, I take no credit for this. I think it's a brilliant infographic. I'm not sure if you can see the detail of that, but it was developed by the Climate Action um, Tracker, which is a great website. I recommend it to you. Um, the, this diagram, I think, tells a lot of stories. I just want to start with a little bit of history. I think um, Mercedes and Priya both sort of noted the rather disappointing outcomes uh, presented for mitigation. I'm going to be speaking about mitigation side at COP27, but I just want to put that into some historical context. Um, I'm sure I don't 
speak to them much too long. Um, the, you'll notice that the thermometer there goes way above four degrees, uh, you know, possibly five, six. And, and I've been involved in this area. Of, I think my, the first COP I went to was uh, COP six, I think, you know, it's quite early on. And in those the times, for people who have sort of gone back quite a while, a lot of the scenarios that people were worried about were four and a half, five, possibly even more degrees. Um, so you'll notice that most of the, most of the current uh, focus is completely down from that. I don't think anybody's really looking at four plus degrees as a realistic outcome. Um, so there's a lot of glass half full, glass half empty sort of discussion around that. I, I include the quote there from uh, uh, Climate Action Tracker as Glasgow's credibility gap, uh, a lip service to climate action, and clearly a, a glass half empty sort of narrative. Um, but I do want to push back against the sort of hopelessness, the, the risk of being hopeless in this, in this discussion. I think the fact that we're in a world where we're not going to be going uh, certainly not above four degrees, almost certainly not above three degrees. Um, and I feel like two degrees is achievable. And when two degrees was uh, uh, set as the original sort of target in Kyoto, um, that was seen as a really like stretch uh, kind of target. And I think this is becoming way more possible and probable, actually, that two degrees is, um, you know, is achievable. And I know that, that uh, the whole discussion about one and a half versus two versus beyond two is very politically fraught, and I don't want to go there too much. But I do think there's a danger, the flip side, the danger that it just becomes hopeless and you sort of give up. Um, so that's one thing to say. The second sort of, uh, just think about why that's happened, actually. I mean, the, the reason, the main reason that whole debate has changed is because renewables is so cheap. And the reason renewables is so cheap is actually that people did respond to COP6 uh, and the whole Kyoto. The well, Kyoto fell over structurally, and it's not the structure that we have now. Um, but the EU did respond to the uh, Kyoto by putting in train renewables targets. China uh, saw a strategic advantage in piling in behind that, and that has led to cheap renewables. And that is essentially a response to what ostensibly is a failed um, structure for organizing ourselves globally on climate change. But it did lead to real outcomes, which have completely fundamentally changed the economics of the energy system. So good things come out of what looks like a failure. Um, just coming to another message here. So there's a the point of that quote is that there's a credibility gap between the policies and actions that are in place, which is the left hand bar, the targets that have been set for 2030, which is the purple one, and then the pledges and targets. And Mercedes um, talked about the 20, uh, about the net zero, which is essentially a 2050 pledge. And the and critics would sort of say, well, it's very easy to make long term pledges for things which the politicians are not going to possibly be even alive for, let alone responsible for. Um, I should, I should, I think there's certainly truth in that, it's, it's somewhat easier, but I would say that actually when you look at the UK, 2050 net zero is influencing the way people are thinking about things, trying to restructure markets, there's an electricity market reform process going on right now, which I'm partly involved in with UK. And I've just come back from Vietnam last week, and Vietnam's in the same boat, they made a pledge for net zero at COP26. And they're putting, and that's flowed through to a whole load of sector targets, which nobody's quite sure how it's going to actually work. It looks horrendously optimistic, and it actually, you know, forces ministries to think about how they're going to do this stuff. It doesn't mean to say they will achieve it, and I think there will still be a gap, but it, I think it does force the pace of discussion. Um, so I'm just going to finish um, on the right hand side of the pledges and targets. Um, part of the narrative of the disappointing outcome uh, on for COP27 is that it didn't make that much progress compared to COP26, but COP26, the original way Paris was set up was to have five yearly ratchets, so it's a bottom up, you know, we pledge to do X, Y and Z and we'll come back in five years time and, and try and increase that. One of the things that happened at COP26 was that the five yearly ratchet process got turned into a one yearly ratchet process because everyone was like, there's no, you can't wait for five years because we'll never get to one and a half degrees. I think the flip side of that is a, an annual ratchet 
it's just the normal run of the COP process. I mean, the COPs happen every year anyway. And so in my mind, I feel like that was not necessarily from a political economy point of view, a great thing, because you, you, you know, the whole point of the five yearly thing is you build up pressure. It gives you time to actually develop a national strategy, really up your game and then come to the table with a better plan. Whereas I think an, an annual process, I feel, is likely to be more disappointing. Um, I think I probably should stop there because otherwise I'm in danger of just carrying on talking for the whole time. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, William, for the great talk. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is Matthew Blanu from Warwick uh, Business School. Matthew is a research fellow at Warwick Business, uh, Business School uh, where he is working in the UK Team 1 group. So, uh, which is a project focused on UK energy in the global uh, context. His research is focused on geopolitical economy of energy system transition and UK net zero ener energy policy. And beyond that, he's also interested in variety of topics at, at the intersection of global uh, climate and energy politics. So, Matthew. Didn't expect to be talking for such a large group actually so um, it's quite uh, overwhelming but anyway um, all right I've got one slide and this is probably something uh, you saw in uh, or similar to what uh, Mercedes was showing as well in her uh, presentation so in my introductory comments um, I want to talk about fossil fuels in particular um, and and their role at COP27 because um, I think they're the primary culprit of course of climate change and, and something that isn't always discussed enough uh, at, at COP meetings. Um, just to give you some figures at the outset, the burning of fossil fuels caused 86% of all CO2 emissions during the past 10 years. And the production and consumption of fossil fuels caused 64% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. And so, as I said, despite being the first and foremost culprits of climate change, coal, oil, and natural gas, or fossil gas, if you will, were barely mentioned in the official text of, uh, of previous uh, UN climate change summits. Um, and I think that that kind of change that COP26 last year in November 21 with the Glasgow Climate Pact, the agreement contained the first ever implicit uh, or to a certain extent explicit acknowledgement as well of, of the role of fossil fuels in causing climate change by by urging nations to phase out fossil fuel subsidies or inefficient fossil fuels fossil fuel subsidies and to phase down um, coal power so that's what was in the text last year and the hope that this could be extended to a phase down of all fossil fuels uh, at this year's cop was actually soon uh, squashed and I think that has to do with the context of, of the global energy crisis that we're currently in, or, or, or the global fossil fuel crisis, rather. Um, so let's have a look at these fossil fuels and, and what's happened in the past year or so and what role they played at COP27. Um, so I'll be talking about the, these fossil fuels in particular and, and injected a little bit with some political economy and, and geopolitics. And so have we basically been living up to uh, the promises made at, at the COP last year? Um, and, and are we honoring those promises and those expectations? So first about uh, natural gas, of course, the story there begins with Russia's invasion in, 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 uh, in Ukraine and, and, and the, the energy crisis this has sparked in Europe. Um, because Euro Europe really rapidly had to adjust to uh, Russia's or Russia using its gas exports to, to the continent as a weapon, so basically the weaponization of its gas trade or gas exports. And, and as the, the Kremlin cut pipeline gas supplies to Europe, European countries basically had to rush onto the global LNG market, so liquefied natural gas markets, to secure energy supplies so as not to have energy uh, or physical energy shortages uh, this winter. Um, but this, of course, has raised natural gas prices to record heights and created a global scramble uh, for gas in which Europe is outbidding uh, developing countries in the global south, particularly such as Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan and, and other countries. Um, and so that's quite problematic, not only because uh, Europe is outbidding these countries and essentially depriving to a certain extent these countries from natural gas, 
um, at the same time, pipeline flows have uh, reduced from Russia to the EU, uh, but Russian LNG exports to, to Europe have actually, actually gone up. So there is a bit of a, a contradiction there in, in Europe's policies uh, towards Russia when it comes to um, uh, importing natural gas. Um, and so at the same time, also depressed demand for gas in China due to the ongoing COVID-19 restrictions, of course, have been the saving grace that allowed Europe to fill its storage tanks ahead of winter. So it's basically LNG and depressed demand elsewhere as well. And so uh, the COP27 outcome document emphasizes the need to increase renewable energy and low emissions energy as well, basically leaving the door open for natural gas to be considered as a, a low emission energy uh, source, but also as a transition fuel, if you will. And I mean, talking about natural gas deals at, at COP27 as well, Egypt, the host country, in the run-up to COVID uh, or COP27 and, and during COP27, they basically signed a couple of natural gas deals as well. And it's not just uh, Egypt. Uh, earlier this week, um, Germany and Qatar signed a, a long-term 15-year LNG uh, contract as well. Um, so um, that's quite interesting, of course. Uh, coal, so there was this pledge at COP26 as well to phase down coal-fired power generation as well. Um, some of the developing economies that, um, of course, have been deprived of natural gas due to Europe's scramble of gas had to turn to um, coal-fired power generation as well to avoid blackouts, even though they are now being uh, faced with all these blackouts. And actually, global coal consumption will match its all-time high of 2013. Uh, this year. In the EU as well, global uh, or in the EU, uh, demand for coal or coal consumption, primarily in the electricity sector, has gone up uh, as well. And global coal consumption um, this year is expected to rise at a global level uh, by 6.5% uh, this year. Um, and so I think these are the, the, this also shows that we're not necessarily living up to the promises made uh, when it comes to natural gas and coal. Uh, or fossil fuels uh, at the um, at the COP20 COP26 last year, and then just a short note on oil as well. Oil demand has been rebounding as well uh, this year and in 2021 after the pandemic. And quite interestingly, um, um, talking about this idea of trying to expand the language on the phase down of coal-fired power generation to the phase down of fossil fuels as a whole at this year's COP. Um, Russia and Saudi Arabia, of course, two big uh, oil producing countries as well. Um, they basically, uh, in uh, behind closed doors meetings, they said, it's not, yeah, I know, thank you. Um, it's not oil that causes global warming, it's basically uh, emissions that cause global warming, which kind of reminds us of the NRA talking points, the National Rifle Association talking points in the United States saying it's not guns that kill people, it's people that kill people. So, um, yeah, I mean, I only have a minute and a half left. So basically the point that I'm trying to make is that, and it's perhaps slightly more pessimistic than what Will has been talking about, uh, we're not living up to the expectations that we've been created around these COPs, not just last year, but in the past 30 years or so, since we had the establishment of the UNFCCC in 1992. And basically what you see here on this slide is uh, uh, what, what Mercedes has shown as well. It's the rise in atmospheric um, CO2 concentrations um, since the 1960s, I believe, indeed. And all these diplomatic breakthroughs, UNFCCC establishment, the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Accord, if you can call that a diplomatic breakthrough, of course, but also the Paris Agreement, et cetera, et cetera, there is no... I mean, there's no slowdown in the growth in that, of atmospheric uh, CO2 emissions. So I think um, yeah, the recent year has shown us that um, energy security concerns are trumping uh, climate concerns as well. So that comes back to that point around the energy trilemma as well as uh, Mercedes was talking about. And the climate clock is ticking and fossil fuels need to be at the heart of every uh, agreement and every a measure that is being undertaken to meet the Paris goal uh, or the Paris uh, agreement objectives. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mathieu, for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, next, I would like to invite Laura uh, Stefanini from U University of Sheffield. Laura is a PhD researcher at the Department of Material Science and Engineering 
at the University of Sheffield. Laura's research focuses on decarbonization of cement industry in line with sustainable development of, con uh, con uh, of the construction industry and with a circular economy. So, well, my, my take is a bit different. I wanted to show you what my experience at COP have been and what's my personal point of view. Uh, so, I'm a final year PhD student. I work at the University of Sheffield. Um, some of my uh, group members are here from the Sustainable Materials Group. Uh, and my work is on uh, alternative cement. Um, which are called alternative materials, but I started to call them uh, green cements to make it more accessible. Um, so they're basically binder materials which contain uh, zero cement, and they're basically all made out of waste materials. Um, I'm part of a European project, uh, and I'm also a scholar at the Grantham Center, which I wanted uh, to thank to give, to give me the opportunity to participate, uh, to go to COP27. Uh, you can see here a picture of uh, my team that came with me from my university. We're all PhD students across all faculties. Um, where you can see Ayman, Charlie, which is here somewhere, uh, Rachel and me. Um, and we went during uh, week one of COP. Um, week one is more um, all based on summit uh, announcement, uh, so not much uh, meat uh, of negotiations. Um, but we, um, so I, I want to show you um, what an overview of the events that I've been attending uh, to. So my uh, the main um, interest that I had in the um, the COP agenda is the decarbonization, specifically of the uh, construction industry. And uh, while well, I'll give you an overview of the uh, construction sector, how it is now in the decarbonization process. So they released the roadmap uh, for net zero more than about one year ago. And one of the first events that I attended to in uh, COP was the well, when they released the global status report, uh, in which they said that they are not on track during this first year, they're quite off. Uh, but not to panic, because they went through uh, many different uh, events, implementation labs, and the main event was the cement and concrete breakthrough, uh, in which these main players of the uh, concrete uh, industry um, they talk about the strategies uh, that we have to decarbonize the industry. But these main strategies are all based on carbon capture and on the efficiency of um, uh, energy efficiency, of uh, uh, kiln efficiency, uh, some new materials, but nothing at all of, on what I study, what my research is on, which is in novel and alternative material. Um, I also got the chance, the opportunity to talk and to uh, get my, what my research, my research is on to these main players. It's probably one of the few occasions that I will get to do that. So some, that's a really positive side. But the, the letdown is uh, in these over 50 events, side events, there was absolutely nothing in what my research has been on throughout my PhD. Uh, well, finally, this is really my personal pathway through COP. Uh, I started that I was incredibly excited to go to this uh, very important event. Uh, I felt very confused at the beginning for the nature of the event. It is very big, there is a lot going on. Uh, also, I felt multiple times that the discussion wasn't so clean as I expected. Uh, and then, well, eventually, I started to feel a bit scared for the, well, there was this big ambition on the uh, being off track, the 1.5 target. 
also when I felt that my research was not taken into any consideration. That, that, that was quite scary for me. And well, the final decision, as we, everyone has been saying, that is being disappointing. But well, after that, after I came back, I did have a chance to really think uh, deeply through what I've been through. And that's really not the message that I like to transmit to. I would like to transmit this hope, hope that we can make it, hope that we, well, we, that we can get close to the 1.5 target that we peak before 2025. And we just need to really uh, work together, work very hard. And also I want to believe in the COP system, which is mainly the, the only tool that we have. And we can still go beyond the, of the, the, the decision that, is, that has been made uh, in the event. There is nothing that stops us toward, uh, towards that. So well, that's, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Laura, for sharing your experience with us. Uh, our next speaker is Miriam Walter from Astor University. Miriam is a reader at uh, the Energy and Bioproduct Research Institute at Aston University. She is an experienced research leader in sustainable bioenergy system and, and the transition to low carbon society, bridging engineering, natural and social sciences. Miriam has an extensive research experience in the bioenergy sector, including biomass availability, conversion technologies, BECs, and end use demand. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Priya. If I would have known you need to read out the whole thing, I would have just sent a couple like Miriam Rhoda. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> it's very nice to be here. It's amazing to see all of you. I'm just kind of like totally known how many of you are here, um, which, is, which is fantastic. And I can just echo what Mercedes said earlier speak to each other because um, the older generations put a lot of pressure on you and now waiting for you to sort out <laughs> what, what we have done and um, I think I have, I have about 32 slides in five minutes <laughs> no I'm just kidding I have, I have only like 27 I think um, <laughs> no but um, I think a lot of what I'm going to say has been said already um, I'm going to echo a lot of actually what Mercedes has been saying, and we didn't we didn't communicate beforehand, but I think it just shows the agreement in science on what the situation is and where we are. And um, so I tried to do it in five minutes, and if not, you just start shouting at me, please. Um, or you just kind of like limit the drinks I get in the reception tonight, and that will definitely work in my case. Um, so. Um, when, when I was asked to reflect on COP27, I was like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> that, that, that is quite a challenge to not be totally kind of like pessimistic. And I'm glad that the Mercedes kind of like had this really positive and, and energetic approach to how to tackle the challenge. So I was thinking like, so we're talking about 1.5 degrees and I want to stick to 1.5 degrees because I think two degrees is disastrous because I think talking about degrees is the wrong approach. We need to talk about impacts and the cost of impacts. Um, so degrees are just irritating, I find. Uh, as a net zero a bit, because again, it's a political target. And the other thing we need to think about, we talk about COP27. So we had 27 summits on climate change mitigation and addressing climate change. And we need to think about what that they actually achieved. First of all, when we think about where COP happened, uh, Dan, Dan A, uh, where are you? Lift your hand. Dan over there, he made that graph because he knows how to use GIS compared to me, he doesn't. Um, so if you want to know about GIS and how to use it, talk to Dan over there. Um, thinking about where does COP actually happen? And then thinking about what are the countries having the highest emissions, not necessarily on territory, but per capita, and what are the countries having the highest impact experience already the highest impact Then we need to think about where does COP happen and Laura thank you so much for sharing your experience being at COP where you said it was confusing and it was scary so how accessible is COP actually for people making decisions 
on people and people exist. So just kind of like think about it. I don't have an answer to it. And like Mercedes had earlier on her numbers, that's just a bit of like good for thought for, for you all. So 27 summits, emissions keep increasing. We have the highest emissions levels we have ever seen. That's just CO2. If we put on top the non-CO2 emissions, it doesn't look any better. And these are also emissions which will be much harder to tackle while we have solutions, as Mercedes showed earlier. And I keep referring to you, Mercedes, sorry about that. <laughs> she doesn't pay me for that. <laughs> but she's so right, because there are emissions we can actually tackle quite easily, which are CO2 emissions, but there are also other things we need to think about when we talk about emission reduction. And then we talk about annual emissions happening, but this graph has now appeared several times. Um, the PPM concentration, everything which is already up there in the atmosphere will stay there for a very long time. And we talk, need to talk about emission budgets and how much is actually left to do something. And we're not having much time left. We have something like seven years left to stay within 1.5 degrees. Um, so that's also the thing we need to start thinking about moving away from these very political targets, which might not be very helpful in terms of actually implementing things. If we look at the mitigation pathways, if we want to mitigate or stay within 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, um, we need negative emissions. So we need solutions which actually reduce carbon, remove carbon from the atmosphere. So it's not just about, obviously, it's a lot about mitigation and we need to mitigate much faster and much more. But we also need to find solutions to actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. And obviously, they're engineering and nature based solutions. This is what the UK has done over the last few years in terms of emission reductions. So there is a downward trend, which is fantastic. And the UK has been one of the leaders to actually do something. But at the same time, by 2050, there will be residual emissions. And we need negative emission technologies like carbon dioxide removal technologies. And depending on how well the UK does in terms of mitigation, the range will change between about so the estimations are 32 to 130 million tons of co2 which need to remove from the atmosphere annually by 2050. this is what the committee on climate change says to the uk net zero target the black line at the bottom is where we want to achieve net zero by 2050 the green bit at the top is where policy actually is implemented at the moment where we have a high certainty we will reach it so even though we have these targets in the uk what policy is doing at the moment is far not enough to actually reach these targets. So there's this kind of like contradiction between, yes, we have these targets, it's all implemented by law, but what is in place is by far not enough. Then we talk about carbon dioxide removal. And everybody is talking about CCS. I do, I do a lot of research on particular BACs. Um, I know that people in the room are also working on DACs. And we think that is one of the one of the silver bullets and we need it because we have no choice because we actually have messed things up in terms of um, emissions and everybody is talking about ccs but then if we think about what we actually have in place at the moment that is quite depressing but it's not so depressing because the technology is actually there we just need to implement so the the the, the big columns are what we want to have in you probably show me a minus two now. <laughs> the, the big column is where we need to be in terms of capacity, CCS capacity by 2050. The kind of like bit blobs, the red blobs next to it is what we have at the moment. So we have about 30 years to get to what we need to do um, to stay within 1.5 degrees. So you're here, we're putting it to you. Solutions are needed not just solutions, obviously policy and investments is needed as well. Another thing we talk a lot about is afforestation, because that is considered as well as a good solution to reduce CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. At the moment, the uptake from forests in terms of CO2 per year is 7.6 gigatons of CO2. Compared to annual CO2 release to the atmosphere, this is, this is literally nothing. Right. So what is there in, for, in terms of forest at the moment is by far not enough to solve the problem. So everybody is talking about afforestation. Policymakers love to talk about planting trees, or they're not so much love about implementing CCS. But if we look what's happening on a global scale, 
is that in some regions of the world, yes, forest area is increasing at a slow rate, but it is. But in other regions, it is still not increasing, it's actually decreasing. So again, we're talking about a solution which is still not working and still not implemented. And if we want to do it, we need to think about where, how, when. So my reflection on COP, um, we had 27 COPs. Global emissions are at the highest point. They're slowing down, but they're still increasing. Carbon dioxide removal technologies and um, approaches are there. They are understood and they are proven. But the deployment and upscaling is lagging far behind on where we actually need to be. I'm a systems researcher. System approaches, and Mercedes mentioned that. Thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> you make my life much easier. <laughs> System approaches are needed to understand the sectorial interfaces because in the end it is down also to work with industry. But we also need to understand the stakeholder impacts. And that is stakeholders, not just industry and policymakers, that is the public as well, people. Policy and investment need to be, are needed, definitely, but they need to be sustainable and fair. Because as you said, it's a nice Nipuya, this COP was the COP for Africa. It is about the people who actually experience the severe impacts from climate change. So the solutions need to be fair and sustainable. And when we talk about jobs and skills, these need to be considered to also consider growth and wealth in developing countries, in the global south. Climate change mitigation and net zero is much more than, than carbon. So we need co-design decision-making and deployment. So we need to talk to people, not just, to, not just you guys talking to each other, you need to talk to your communities, you need to talk to the stakeholders relevant for your research. And really people should be at the heart of the solutions and the solutions are needed. So we need to make them with them. And that's from me. And it was more than five minutes, I think, but I hope it was interesting. Well, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam, for the very interesting talk. Uh, before we start with the questions and the panel discussion, I would like to invite Mercedes to join us uh, in the panel. So, uh, very interesting talk, and let's open for question. Is there any question here from the audience? Oh, yes, please. Can you please introduce yourself first? And, and, and. Uh, my name is Abdulaziz. I work at RUGHG. I have a comment and a question. The an asteroid will be coming to the direction of Earth within the next 12 months. I can assure you that the world will put the right resources to uh, decapitate the asteroid before it heats the Earth. Global conferences on climate change, after conferences on climate change, they have a need of expectation. What is wrong with people? What is wrong with us? I have my thoughts, but can you on the panel share your thoughts on the reason behind why it is so difficult for the world to come together to solve this problem? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you want to start? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Mercedes? No, I don't think. I don't think. So I just use this for home. So why is it not working? Why, why do we need 27, 28, and, and how many more do we go? I think it's a, it, is a, it is a complex global problem, but I think it's also there is so much more going on that is not happening in COP. And I think for, when it comes to COP conference, because you know the very high delegations, it has a huge profile. But maybe we are hyping them too much in terms of what we are really expecting that finally the solution is going to happen. I mean, the solution is not going to happen. But we know that if you look around the world, we are all working on developing technologies and policy and business models for making it happen. 
community. And that's happening with other sort of COP27 and COP28. So I think we need to understand that the, it is important, these COP meetings are very important in terms of those global agreements that are reached there. But that's not the only thing, that's not the only show happening now. It's quite far from that. When you look around the room and you want to discuss the projects, you realize this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to make the net zero transition happen. And yes, we do need to have finance models. We need to make sure you know, that there are high level delegations that actually negotiate terms and conditions that are palatable to a large number of the society. But it's uh, difficult. I mean, I've had this year quite an in depth view uh, because of the, the, the council I was representing there. I have quite a lot of insights that I, I didn't get when I was in COP26 in Glasgow. And, and I think we need to understand how difficult those negotiations are. They are very, very complex. And I'm by no means giving them excuse, but they are very complex. That should not stop us from doing what we are doing here, because this is what is really going to make the net zero transition happen. And as we get these technologies and these business models and this policy, and we are able to feed that and have an impact. If you remember one of the things that I said, it's really good that we have our scientific papers. And as a professor, I'm very proud of them. But I know the impact of my research has to go beyond that. And it is really important, it has been said before, that we really communicate what research can do. So I think you were saying you were a bit disappointed that you know it, it didn't really come across that clearly. And I think the honors is a little bit on us. I don't think we should say, well, you know, they go there, they negotiate, they didn't manage. Let's wait till the next one in, in Dubai. We need to do more on our end. We need to be much more active in terms of the impact of what we do and how we can help. So when negotiators go to COP28 in Dubai, they at least have a much better chance to negotiate terms where they understand what technology can do. Um, Matthew? Yeah, if I, if I can add to that, I think he's a, I completely agree with uh, Mercedes. I think we have to realize or think about what is the actual purpose of, of these COPs? What is the purpose of these meetings? And I guess the the overall or the end objective is indeed getting emissions down and getting uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere down. But I, I think you also have to see it as a first and foremost venue and basically the only venue that exists where all, literally all countries in the world come together and talk to each other about this problem. And it's already quite something uh, that, you, that you can succeed in that, bringing all these countries around the world uh, uh, yeah, around the table and, and talking about climate change. And I also think that, I mean, for all the criticism that you can have on, on this process, this diplomatic process, there's also some significant um, outcomes that these negotiations have uh, generated. And I'm thinking around, uh, or, or of a specific idea around common but differentiated responsibilities. This is a, a global, international, social norm that has been ingrained through the UNFCCC process that rich countries, more developed countries, if you will, economically developed countries, they have to take bigger responsibility in addressing climate change uh, before developing economies, for example, or countries in the global south. So I think, and that, and, and to, uh, I guess perhaps a bit more broadly, um, I've never been to a COP. Uh, last year it was organized in Glasgow and a couple of my colleagues uh, from the University of Warwick went there. They were quite critical of the COP process as well. But what they said, what was really striking as well, it's also the only venue where uh, countries and representatives from the global south are actually really uh, have access to a global stage to voice their concerns around climate change as well. So I think as a venue for negotiations and for giving voice to people that are often deliberately unheard as well, uh, that that COP process is, is quite important as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, do you want to come? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This way. Yeah. I think you have a very profound question there that goes to the heart of what it means to be a human being. And I mean, it's, um, you know, I think human beings are capable of great acts of beauty and, you know, cooperation. They're also capable of great feats of, you know, cruelty and evil. And, and I think there is something deep inside us. We're not. But this is, I think this level of society is relatively new in our evolution, and you think back to what, we, what it means to be human. I think the world is still learning how to cooperate at a global level. Um, your asteroid scenario is quite an interesting one. I mean, it's hypothetical, but you think of the real scenarios of stepping back from the brink of nuclear war, which have similar and devastating impact. 
impacts, and that has happened in history, so there's signs of encouragement, but it doesn't mean to say we would step back from the brink every single time. I think there is a risk. And, you know, so the climate is well, the same order of magnitude, but it's a different type because it's more of a boiling crop type of problem where, you know, we can always put off. And we're running out of time to put off, I totally agree with that. But, you know, you're still in that sort of boiling frog scenario of how much can you take before you really move. Um, but I do, um, I just wanted to reflect on the COP, the overwhelming nature of COP. I totally agree with that. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary kind of process and what it means to have that range of room, of competing narratives in a single room where you're trying to make sense of so many different perspectives, so many different voices. It's really hard, and I would just point back again. I think people have heard earlier, but it is sort of the only game in town in terms of getting the world to cooperate. But actually, a lot of the action happens in uh, outside of that, which I think um, so, yeah, that was not an answer to your question, but uh, uh, thanks for the question because I think it goes, it goes really deep. Yeah, thank you very much. We have yes, great. I have a question from our virtual audience. So the question is, in light of the energy transition that we need to achieve to meet the Paris Agreement targets, and acknowledging that the narrative is slowly shifting towards a whole system approach, what in your opinion are the enablers for policy development in some sectors, and how could the research community contribute in informing these decisions? Okay, good. I can take you on. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so, well, what are um, these, these strategies that we are uh, implementing as a national? Uh, mainly speaking about carbon culture and energy efficiency. Um, this is also from the their point of view is that from now to 2050, we're going to need such a volume of building materials, especially in developing countries, that probably cannot even process how much this would be. So they mentioned this uh, 4.5 billion tons of uh, building materials. So in their, in their perspective, there is no way in which uh, we're going to reduce this amount of production. And so what I also want to mention that uh, Main problem with cement industry, uh, apart from energy efficiency, as one other level of emissions, uh, which are the what, what I call intrinsic emissions, which are due to the chemical reaction of production of cement, uh, and those uh, can be eliminated at least you use a cement free yeah. uh, But as you know, the main players, the wood rights, the roadmaps um, for localization. What, what I've seen and caught about also what I can do comes mainly from one CEO of cement plants. That's, that's, um, that's where the disconnect is. Uh, they won't find a way to reduce the cement production, uh, even if we do have other options. And that those options are the ones that were not mentioned as a benefit to the cement or, um, or a solution which can supplement the cement uh, production, not replace it by government. So that, that is why uh, uh, what's missing. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, I want to take a bit. Kind of like want to take a step back because I think um, it is obviously not just down to policymakers to to implement um, the targets, even though obviously we need policies and, and governments. Um, but it is down in the end to to everyone how we or how, the way we live, the way what we expect our lifestyle is, and to try to reduce emissions where we can, but also be realistic at. There are things where some people, we put it quite nicely, for example, with, with uh, the global south, uh, 
people that obviously can't reduce emissions because they need to work. You know, they, they, they need to kind of like reach a certain level of wealth and livelihoods, first of all, and that will come with emissions. And I think there's a responsibility, um, and that responds to your question as well, why don't we get anywhere uh, around behavior and behavioral changes? Um, and I think where policy comes in, uh, when we do our research around public perception, there's often the challenge that the public just don't trust policymakers, at least in this country, and I think it's also in other countries. And if a policy, you know, if politicians stand there and talk about net zero, um, that doesn't necessarily reach the public as urgent need. The other thing is that, obviously, as long as we don't experience climate change in countries which produce most of the emissions, we don't take it serious, very seriously as well. Um, but then we also have a responsibility as researchers around what Nassif said, around the we're becoming best friends today. <laughs> and I still can confirm she doesn't pay me. <laughs> no, but <laughs> good. <laughs> is that is that on record? Good. <laughs> no, but um I think it's about the communication of scientific evidence, which is really key, and um, be very clear, transparent, and um, not simplistic, but realistic about what's possible, what's not possible, and what's needed. And that is a to the public, because apparently the public seems to trust um, researchers more than politicians, for some reasons. <laughs> some of my should answer that, I do it, but that's very much my own opinion, um, because I'm a researcher and not a politician. Um, but I think it's also to others, like the industry, like policymakers, to have that clear communication and engagement around um, what we actually can do, what evidence is there. And I think I see that a lot around the discussion around facts, where we know the technology is there and it works and it's proven. But and it could be it could be deployed straight away if investment and the decision making would be there and if we have co-designed structures which also considers the concerns of the public or people who are directly affected. So I think um, yes policy sets targets and frameworks and wants to achieve something which is important because we need the leadership. But I think the, the bottom-up approaches are very, very much important and the scientific community has a responsibility to, to support these bottom-up approaches. What we see, which is fantastic around, for example, around the uh, climate change protests and to also support that. So we, we often, as a researcher, just focus on, oh, we need to inform policymakers, but there's a massive movement, the critical mass from the climate change um, activism, which can also actually do this, require some support and supporting the arguments and actually challenging policy makers and uh, leaders in this world. Hey, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, Hi everyone, my name is Said Bello from Novara University. Thank you for your great presentation and insight about the COP27. There is something that's bothering my mind is that when I look at the World Energy Outlook 2021 from International Energy Agency, I discovered that the African country, in terms of the contribution to the global emission, is less than 5%. So, then, even with the report, the report suggested that even if the African country tried to use all the fossil fuel, they will still contribute to less than 10% of the global emission. So, I was thinking that then, why should Africans be concerned about the first subsidy removal? Because of the qualities that are behind the first subsidy. Because when, anytime there is an issue of removing the first subsidy in African countries, there is always a kind of a conflict because of the situation of the continent in terms of the welfare. So what is your intake about the discussion based on your experience of COP27 about the issue of the first subsidy removal in Africa? And what is the approach that can be used? Because the African is not contributing much to the global mission. Other than discussing about the climate, Mitigation. I think most Africa actually need priority on climate adaptation, other than the issue of the forest subsidy removal, whatever. 
What is your experience about the discussion on the first of the mover during the COP27 discussion? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Uh, anyone from the PAYA, Mercedes? Do you want to say? I, I can take that because that's something that's been going on in my head as well for some time. And I was there in the COP as well. But, but there is a message that goes together with that one that you said there. And, and the, the message that goes along with that one is that when you look in Africa and Asia, probably close to 1 billion people or a bit less have no energy access. There we go have no energy access. Okay, so this is not even that they're contributing with 5%, it's just they don't have energy access. So I, I think what we need to consider when we think about the global south and we think of Africa, we think of Asia, is it's not really about maybe the same message as we're having in the north in terms of some of the technologies. This is not about being evangelical in terms of what we are doing here. It's quite far from that. This is really about understanding how we can develop those solutions, how we can actually make sure that when that one billion people do get access to energy, they don't do it in the dirty way that we did it when we started the industrial revolution. And I think that's really the key message there. And, and the other thing that you know was kind of going on my head when I was there as well is this thing and kind of remembering which panel I was when it was said is it was we need to understand that when you talk about climate change, when you talk about climate action, global is local and local is global. And, and it goes back to that thing that you know generational, I consider more approach that I mentioned before. So I think this is not about saying this is really my only problem, this is how I'm going to it. I'm sure that what Africa Nation and the Global South want is actually make sure that everybody has energy access. And that's really the focus of those conversations. Yes, loss and damage, because the countries where actually have put historically less huge emissions are going to be the ones, are the ones that are receiving it. Because we have seen in Pakistan and you know, the problems there were catastrophic. But what happened now when we have 1 billion people, or well, 750 million, so you want to be more accurate, somewhere there, that they do get energy access? What are we going to do? That's really the question. So the question is not how much it happened in the days we do anything. The question is they probably, I'm sure, want to have energy access. So how we can help to make sure that they don't do it with the same mistakes as we did in the past? Thank you, yes, Matthew. Yeah, if I, if I can just add to that, um, so I completely agree with your point that Africa, of course, uh, or Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, has been the smallest contributor to, to climate change uh, in terms of geographical regions, and it's one of the hardest hit, of course, because um, an average American fridge actually consumes more energy than an average household in, 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 in a number of uh, African countries per year. So it's absolutely uh, not to African, sub-Saharan African countries to deal uh, with climate change or to, to mitigate their emissions. It's first and foremost to the richer countries in this world. Second, it's primarily also um, Western countries, uh, OECD countries that have been pushing around the world to reduce uh, fossil fuel consum consumption subsidies in developing countries as well. And what we saw now with the current energy crisis is basically Western countries in Europe that are resorting to these exact fossil fuel subsidies as well to make sure that their uh, own households and companies aren't faced with too high uh, energy prices. So there's a bit of a, uh, a contradiction there as well. That said, there are of course some good arguments to, to reduce and phase out, phase down these fossil fuel subsidies and they are of course, uh, environmentally harmful and, and, and climate impactful because they're fossil fuel subsidies. They make the consumption of fossil fuels cheaper. Second, they're mostly inefficient as well. Uh, research has shown that there are other ways um, that uh, make um, or, or that should make it cheaper for people to, to uh, should make it easier for developing countries to develop their economies as well. And they're also socially and economically regressive in the sense that it's mostly middle income higher income households that benefit more from these fossil fuel subsidies than lower income households, even if they're supposedly targeted to lower income households. So there are some good reasons evidently to phase them out anyway. Yeah. And one here, so we take that. We can take only, a, sorry, one more question, but you can of, of course continue the discussion during the break. So yes, please. 
Is it working? Okay, great. Hi, uh, my name is Saskia. I work as a researcher at Oxford Net Zero, and I'm also a very young researcher. I'm a master's student researching uh, net zero policy changes happening in the UK regarding corporate um, carbon transitions. And I had a question. So all of you highlighted a lot of big problems and also the fact that we have made progress in terms of addressing some of the lower hanging fruit um, concerns. And I feel as a researcher, sometimes I feel so overwhelmed with all the different realms in which we need to make progress. And so I was wondering if in your personal capacity or your expertise, you have any areas that you'd identify as like an impact hotspot. So is it something we need to focus on where um, the problem is just so big that we need lots of help? Or is it something that's an easy win? And also how do we fit in as researchers in terms of how should we focus on whether it's something that's relevant to our skills or to our personal interest or just because it's such a big challenge. Thank you. Um, very, very good point. I think we need everything we can do. There are obviously you know, hot spots and big opportunities and small opportunities, but I think in this situation where we are now, where we have to put ourselves in, it's every, everything is needed. And I think every specialism and expertise and ideas and innovation will help. Um, so there's no this or that, that is this and that. And I think finding your, because I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit like not all-rounder, so I, I do lots of different disciplines and work across different, different disciplines. And I, I think my, my top tip to an early career researcher would be find something you're really passionate about and you feel you actually can make a commitment and then go with that. And it doesn't matter how small the contribution is or how big the contribution is, the key thing is there's a contribution. Yeah, Bill? Yeah, I think just a personal reflection. I mean, I think the longer I I'm in this field, the more I realise that there isn't any one person who has kind of full control of everything. It is, it really is uh, an ecosystem and it's really hard to see the causal kind of connection between everything. I think you're, it always feels like you're a tiny little cog in a huge system and I think that's okay and you just get comfortable with that. And I, from a personal point of view, I think it's sort of the way I've done it is to take stepping stones with a rough Feel. It gets foggy, the view is foggy further out, but you try and take sensible steps, you know, uh, each time you kind of move forward. Very much. Uh, we unfortunately run out of time and we can't take more questions, but feel free to reach to the panelists if you want to discuss further during the break. Thank you very much all for the great discussion and thank you all for attending.